Praise the Lord. It's going to be a great class. I took it personally, and I know it's, man, it's powerful. So you'll be blessed. <clears throat> okay, let's go to the book of Genesis, please, if you would. Amen. In uh, Genesis chapter 4 and 5, and I'm going to start reading with verse 16. <clears throat> And you're going to notice there's a lot of genealogy here. And you would think that there's not a lot in the genealogies, but there's a lot in these chapters, or God wouldn't have given them to us. And so chapter 4, we see the ungodly line of Cain. And in chapter 5, we see the godly line of Seth. Okay, the sons of God versus the sons of the devil. All right, chapter 4 and verse 16. If you're there, say amen. Okay, verse 16 in chapter 4, it says, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod. That means wandering. We talked about getting out of Nod last week, getting out of wandering. It says it was on the east of Eden, and Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. And unto Enoch was born Ired. And Irad begat Mahuchael, and Mahuchael begat Methusael, and Methusael begat Lamech. And Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of one was Ada, the name of the other is Zillah, and Ada bare Jabal. He was the father of such as dwell in tents, and of such as have cattle. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handle the harp and organ. And Zillah, she also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron, and the sister of Tubal Cain was Naamah. And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding, and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God said, She hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also, there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. This is the book of the generations of Adam in the day that God created man in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. Let's lift our hands and love the Lord. Lord, we praise you tonight for your goodness, your mercy, your grace, your presence, God, that is here in this place tonight. We thank you, God, for your awesome anointing and your wonderful word to us. We pray, God, that you would give us understanding. Dear Lord God, that you would speak to every heart in this place tonight, Lord God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Everybody said, in Jesus' name. You may be seated. All right. Go to Matthew 24, please. The area of Scripture that we are looking at right now is a prophetic picture of the end times. So Matthew 24, and verse 36 there, please turn there tonight. All right, verse 36, Matthew 24 in the New Testament brings the area of Scripture that we're studying all the way up into the last days. It tells us this, but of that day and hour knoweth no man... No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. We're talking about the coming of the Son of Man. But as the days, say the days of Noah or Noe. As the days, not just the the time that he lived, but the general time frame of his living. But as the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Now, there's nothing wrong with eating. There's nothing wrong with drinking. There's nothing wrong with marrying. But there is something wrong if that's all that you have in your life. If it's a godless situation you're in. If you're eating without God. 
If you're married and God's not in your marriage. Amen. And so it's a situation where people are so caught up with the present that they don't get ready for the future. And the Lord said that the last days was going to be like that, that people were going to be marrying, giving in marriage, eating and drinking, etc. And just like the days of Noah, the Bible says, uh, verse 39, And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So there's a lot of people that's not going to get ready because they're so focused on the present world and it's a godless system. And they're living for the now. They're living for the present. And they're not getting ready for eternity. So just like the judgment of the flood came and took them away, the judgment of God, the tribulation period is going to fall upon this world. It's going to catch them by surprise because they're not ready, because they're focused only on the now. So these are one of the signs that God gives concerning the last days. And then He goes on, He says in verse 40, Then shall two be in the field... The one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the meal. The one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched, and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour... As you think not, the Son of Man cometh. And He just tells us what to look for concerning the days of His coming. They're going to be as the days of Noah. So tonight we're going to look at this in the Word of God. Going back to verse 16, the Bible says that Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. He dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Cain knew his wife. She conceived and bare Enoch. Now, we have a generation or a genealogy of Canaanites. This is an ungodly line. These people don't know God. They're away from Eden. They're away from the presence of God. They're away from the anointing of God. They're away from the truth of God. They're over here in a far country. And they are away from the Lord. And they're building a society without God in that society. Okay? So this is a generation of Cains that are being brought up. Okay, first one that is born there is Enoch. Now, in this particular area of the word, you're going to see something very interesting because some of the ungodly line have the same names as the godly line. And we'll explain to you the reason for that. But Enoch in this particular area has to do with a new beginning. But it's a new beginning without God. It is a city, a civilization Without God. God is not against civilization. But He is against civilization that leaves Him out of the picture. So this, these people are trying to have a new beginning, but it's a new beginning without God. And they're going to build this huge city and they're going to call it Enoch. And the mayor of the city is going to be Enoch. And it's a society who does not have God in it at all. Okay? Okay? Now, as we look at this society, say Cain with me. In the book of Jude, you'll remember that God warns us about the way of Cain. And you have to understand that Matthew 24 warns us that the days of Noah are signs of the last days before the Lord comes back, right? Have you ever noticed that the book of Jude comes just before the book of Revelation? Do you know that the book of Jude is the door into the book of Revelation? So the book of Jude is warning you what to look for before you move into the things of the book of Revelation the last days. And one thing he warns the last day peoples is that, again, as the days of Noah were, so shall, it be, uh, so shall also it be in the coming of the Son of Man. He tells you to beware of the way of Cain. Now, the way of Cain has its ultimate experience in the Antichrist. You with me? Cain is an Antichrist system. It's going to be fulfilled in the Antichrist. Cain's society is man deifying himself. He's making himself the center of the universe. He's making himself God. He's religious. 
That's why some of the names that we have in the ungodly line are given in the godly line because they're religious. But it's a religious substitution for the truth. Okay? So the Antichrist system of Cain is going to lead where? Where is that way going to lead? There's two ways. Genesis 4 and Genesis 5, we have two ways here. We have an ungodly way and we have a godly way. Where is the ungodly way going to lead to? Where is the way of Cain leading to? It's leading to the lake of fire. Where is the godly line leading to? The new Jerusalem. That's right. Antichrist is man deifying himself. That's the mystery of iniquity, the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The mystery of iniquity is when the Antichrist comes into the world and he makes himself God. But the mystery of godliness is what? 1 Timothy 3.16 Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus wasn't the second person. He was God manifest in the flesh. And so... The righteous Abel and the way of Abel finds its ultimate fulfillment in the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. He being God coming here and saving us. And that leads to the new Jerusalem. Are y'all following my thought here? Praise God. All right, as we look at this, then we see these societies taking place. Number one, we're going to see an advanced, uh, rapid uh, growth in technology. What did the Lord tell us in Deuteron uh, Daniel chapter 12? Let's go there. Daniel chapter 12. The scripture tells us in verse 4. But thou, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, Keep that in mind. And knowledge shall be increased. So he says a sign of the last days is going to be a rapid advancement in technology. Knowledge is going to increase. You see the same thing in this ungodly line of Cain. A rapid increase of advanced knowledge and technology. Do you understand that? In fact, people who have a computer... Um, program that gives you the capability to study the Hebrew language and look for hidden codes in that Hebrew language. Are you familiar with that? That every certain, uh, like say computer, the word computer is found, they say, I haven't checked it out, but they say that the word computer is found in Daniel 12 verse 4. So that God hid encoded in Daniel 12, 4, that knowledge would increase the word computer, letting you know the age of His coming. And that, that computer technology is available to you. You can get it. You can study those codes yourself. But, you know, and I may get that eventually, but if I keep dishing out cash, I'm going to run dry pretty quick. Buying a lot of programs. But you can get that. You can set it for yourself. And they say the word computer is in that. So we have this advance in technology. And again, we see in this chapter, this Canaanite system is a type of that which is to come concerning the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says they're going to run to and fro like on a computer system. Like on the internet going from one place to another. Man, you can go all over the world on the internet. And God encoded the word computer right there. And we're living in the generation where we've seen the computer rise up to prominence. If you don't think we're in the last days, then you are like the generation of Noah who has not got ready for his coming. You are living for the present now and you think everything's going to continue as it was from the beginning. And you don't have to get ready now or you'll get caught up. You'll get uh, swallowed up in the society and you'll be left behind so that's why i'm preaching like i am today so you'll get ready you'll be ready so an advance in technology godless technology 
a godless citizenship, a godless civilization, right? So let's look at some of this, the Bible tells us. Hallelujah. Now I'm not saying having a computer is wrong, I got one. I'm saying though the godless system is what's wrong. Now, it tells us here, okay, um, Enoch built, they built this city, they're going to call the city Enoch, and verse 18, and then Enoch was born Irod. Irod, now Irod has to do with the thought of a rover, like a, a person who is a rover. Okay? Now, there are a lot of people today who are like that, especially when it comes to religious things. They go from one church to another church to another church. Now, if that's you, it's time for you to repent and stay somewhere instead of roving and just being religious. Don't smile too big. And Erod begat Mahujael, and Mahujael begat Methusael. Notice the word El there, Elohim. A part of the name of God is in these names of these, this godless, ungodly, I should say godless, ungodly generation of Canaanites. Why is that? Because it again is a religious substitution. It's a counterfeit for the real. So if you look up here, you'll see a woman riding on the back of the beast. And what does that woman represent? It represents false Christendom. The headship of that false religious system, I hate to tell you, is Catholicism. I can prove it to you. I'm not making this up as I go. I can prove it to you. And they call themselves Christian. They call themselves a church along with many Protestant movements. You know what Protestants are, right? For the most part, their people are not a part of the Catholic Church. But really, they are. So if you think I'm just picking on the Catholic Church, I'm not. Because the majority of your Protestant people are a part of that system. That can be proven. I don't have time tonight. I've got maybe a half dozen tapes on that. But Catholicism and the Protestant movement, along with many charismatic churches, are caught up in this false church system. Amen? That's why they have a part of the name of God here. So we have a war of religion with the truth and the false. Now just because I'm not hanging off these deals here doesn't mean you have to sit there and go to sleep on me. But you see, the last days, the same thing's going to happen. There's going to be a war in religion. There's going to be a fight. See, the fight, Cain killed his brother Abel in church. It was a religious war. Revelation 17 talks about Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots, riding about on the back of the beast. Mystery Babylon takes you all the way to the present now, present day modern religious system called, so-called called the church. And there's a war going on in the spirit. There's great deception and there's the false church and there's the true church. You better find out. I'm going to tell you tonight, you better find out tonight if you're in His church. Because if you're not, you're fixing to go through a great, great tribulation. Suffering like this world has never seen. So that's why they have a part of the name of God here. Okay? Now the Bible goes on and tells us, And Lamech took unto him two wives. So now we see here, not only we see a rapid advance of knowledge but now we see a disregard of God's law concerning marriage most people today think they can marry who they want to marry or they don't even have to get married they can just live together and be perfectly okay it's a sign of the days of Noah this man Lamech was the per first polygamist two wives Completely disregarded. Now I know the law concerning marriage wasn't given until the law of Moses came. But it still wasn't right for him to take two wives. You understand that? 
I want you to notice something here. Another sign. The Bible said Lamech took two wives. Verse 19, the name of the one was Ada. Say Ada. Ada. Which means she was like an ornament. It also means beautiful. It means pleasant. Next one the Bible said was Zillah. Which means shady. So evidently, old Lamech decided to do it this way. He said, I'll take Zillah to be my real wife. And she can take care of all the housework. And I'll take Ada, this beautiful Ada here, and she'll be my mistress. Are you here? So Zillah was the shadow, the shady. She really wasn't a wife. She was just a shadow of a wife. She was just a mistress. You with me? Also her name, Shady, could mean her beautiful flow of hair. So what the Lord is trying to show us, because when you get over here in the godly line of Seth, there's not one woman that's mentioned there. What the Lord's trying to show you is that there's going to be, just like the days of Noah's sensuality, That the women of the world are going to be very sensual. They're going to be very forward. The godly line, they're not even mentioned. The ladies are not even mentioned because they're humble, they're holy, and they're godly. You know what I'm talking about today? We're living in an age when the women of the world, the Canaanite women of the world, are extremely sensual. You can just look at their face and tell they're not shamefaced. They're not humble. They paint themselves up. They got more stuff on them. Man, if they took that off, you'd be afraid. Oh. The godly women are shamefaced, though. They, they're, they're in sobriety. They're, they walk in humility. They're not forward. They're not trying to seduce men all the time. Y'all know what I'm talking about. The women of the world are very sensual. Godly women are totally different. See, and that's what God is trying to show you. Because we don't even have a woman listed over here. But we got them listed over here. And their names mean ornament and then shady. You know, the hair flow and all of that. I tell you what. You know what? If you're a woman, you better thank God that you're in the godly line. And whatever you do... Don't try to compete with the sensual women out in the world. The Bible t- talks about don't be afraid with any amazement in Peter. That means don't worry about your husband getting taken off by one of those sensual women. So you try to compete with that woman. You try to look like she does. You try to pull your skirts up as high as she wears her skirts so you can keep the attention of your husband. God said, don't be afraid with any amazement. You live godly. You live holy. If He leaves you for a woman in the world, at least you've got God and got salvation. Peter tells you, 2 Peter chapter... 3, I believe, 1 Peter 3, y'all turn there sometime, read it. It talks about don't be afraid with any amazement. Don't get into competition with the women in the world. So God has given you a picture all the way back in Genesis about what it's going to be like in the end times. Women are going to be very forward. They're going to be very sensual. They're going to be very seductive. But the godly women are not going to be that way. They're not even mentioned in the godly line. Praise God. And the Bible, hallelujah. Man, you ladies ought to be happy. I want to tell you something. I just might as well stay on this a little bit. Those women out in the world, you know, they point a finger at you and say, you look so pale and you look so drab and you look so dull. Well, just look at them and say, you look so sensual. You look so seductive. You look so whorish. I know what I'm talking about. And I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try not to cross the line here. But when I got, when I, first time I ever went to a Pentecostal church, I saw those godly women and I said, wow, they're the most beautiful women I've ever seen in my life. Most of the ones that I 
been associated with. And as a man, I'm telling you, ladies, as a man, that, listen, that stuff has nothing to do with beauty. Godly women are so much more attractive than the sensual, seductive whores in the world ever thought about being. So don't, you know, don't get into competition with them. Praise the Lord. One time, my wife's boss, you know, my wife's always lived godly before people. She lives it. She don't Practice, you know, act like it. She lives it. And one time, her boss and I know I'm a good friend of his, so you know, whatever. And I know him pretty good. He used to work for him. He walked out on our car one time and he wrote, "In bondage." You know, our car was kind of dirty, you know. And he put "In bondage" on there, huh? Yeah, help me. I'm in. Thank you, Christine. He said, "Help me. I'm in bondage," meaning it for her. Well, here goes the wisdom of God rising up in her the next day. She walked in there to work. And uh, he said, she said, okay, Manny, we'll help you. We, we hear your plea, your cry that you're in bondage. And we're praying for you, Manny. You're not in bondage. You're free. You're a, a daughter of God. You're a daughter of Zion. Don't try to compete with Ada. Don't try to compete with Zilla. Just live for God. Live holy. You don't need all that stuff anyway. So God's showing you all the way back in the book of Genesis about a sensual, seductive group of women in the last days versus the godly women. Hallelujah. Woo! Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. See, let me, let me explain something to you. A lot of people think that's just Pentecostalism. It's not just Pentecostalism. It's God's holy word. It has nothing to do with the denomination. It has to do with holiness. Living before God the way He wants you to live for Him. It has nothing to do with denomination. There's a lot of people that aren't in Pentecostalism that believe the same thing we believe. That's right. They sure do. All right, y'all, y'all get enough of that one? Hmm. So you got to see things for what it really is. You're up against the Spirit. You don't believe me, the false system of religion. You go over there and read how God describes her. He describes her as a harlot. You want to know how a harlot looks? Go to Proverbs. It'll describe the way a harlot, what she does to her face. Just read Revelation 17. You'll find out what the false system looks like. Come on, somebody. And then read the Word of God in the New Testament. You'll find out what the true godly women look like. First Peter chapter 3, I believe that, that is. All right? Praise God. Hallelujah. Man, I love God. Verse 21, his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handle the harp and organ. Say the hand, handles, oops, I got to back up, right? Verse 20, <laughs> sorry. Ada bear Jabal, he was the father of such as dwell in tents and of such as have cattle. Huh, he's going to raise beef. People can have something to eat. Well, I know they didn't eat beef until after Genesis 9. For all you theologians out there that are checking me out. But anyway, he, he was a nomad. Are you with me? Are you following this? See, listen. Whenever Cain went out from the presence of God, he became lonely. So he builds up a city of people around him so he can lose loneliness. So in place of loneliness, city life. Come on. And in the place of unsettledness, Come on, we live in an age as unsettled as it can be. In the place of unsettledness, a love for travel. Now, there's nothing wrong with traveling, 
But if you're traveling to find something like God, you're not going to find God in travel. See, a lot of people just unsettled, so they got to go all the time, all the time. So city life for loneliness and love of travel for unsettledness. And they've got a bad conscience. So you know what they do with a bad conscience? They start getting heroes. Why do you think people put, you know, all these different kinds of people on a high pedestal? You know, athletes or whatever, or movie stars or whatever. They're looking for a hero. You know why? Because they've got a bad conscience. And they look at that person and say, wow, look at that person. Hey! You've got a society of humanism. It's all about you. It's all about humanity. God's not even in the picture. That's what you have right here. Let's look at some more. The Bible said, Zilla, she also bare Tubal-Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass. So he's an instructor. Okay, so we have some instruction going on. We have education, right? Nothing's wrong with education, but education without God is empty. Are you here? And he is an artificer with what? He works with brass and iron. So that's for defense. Defense. They're going to take that and those metals and they're going to make weapons out of them. So now you've got defense. If God is not your defense, you can have a ton of guns in your closet. You can have all kinds of armory in your closet. If God is not your defense, you'll lose. I know people, man. They're so afraid of these last days that they've bought thousands of dollars worth of guns and, and all. Man, I'm telling you. <laughs> bullets, 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 bullets. They're going to fight the whole you in off. Well, I'm not saying it's wrong to have a gun in your house. You probably need one. But I'm talking about if you think you're going to be able to defend yourself and you're going to amass a huge arsenal to defend yourself against the UN I got news for you you better have God in your life because some of you are so out of touch maybe you're just tired I'm sorry I, I, I need to recognize you're tired Hallelujah. if you don't have God you can have all kinds of defense but you'll not be able to save your soul you better have God Uh, is everybody with me? Yeah. Oh, man. God's good. Now, notice. <clears throat> and Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounded and a young man to my hurt. Hmm. You know what? There have been men who have written two solid volumes just on that one little verse trying to explain that one little song of Lamech. Tell me God's Word isn't awesome. Two volumes on one verse. And Lamech, here's the seventh one in the line of the Canaanites. He's a picture that the mountaintop as far as evil is concerned. Say the seventh. This Canaanite system began with murder. And it ends in the seventh when him praising murder. He's singing about, hey, you know what? Tubal Cain, he's built us a defense with weapons and metal. You've got to hear me. We can defend ourselves. We can fight. Listen what he says. He goes to his two wives and he starts bragging. He says, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech. For I have slain a man to my wound and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged seventyfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. That means this, I can take care of myself. Anybody that tries to come around mess with me, I'll just take care of them. I've got the ability to murder them. I've got the ability to kill them. I already killed one man. Look. I don't need God to defend me. I'll defend myself. And he's singing about murder. It began with murder and it ends in murder. I won't keep you long tonight. I promise you. I won't keep you long. 
And then he goes on and Adam knew his wife. Oh, come on. Hallelujah. We talked about this a little bit last week. Adam and Eve got together. They saw that Canaanite society. Their son Abel, the righteous Abel, has been slain. And God had made a promise that through the seed of the woman, he's going to destroy the serpent. He's going to crush the head of the serpent through the seed of the woman. He's going to send a Savior. He's going to send the Messiah. The seed of the woman. And this seed, say the seed. The godly seed of the woman is going to destroy the ungodly seed. Y'all with me now? So they're together. And Abel's dead. He is righteous. And Cain's a vagabond. And he refuses to repent. And he's over in the land of Nod. And he doesn't have a relationship with God. So something has to happen. And God allows Adam to know his wife. And the Bible says again. Say again. And she bare a son called his name Seth. Say, born again. It's a picture of the new birth. This is the way you become a son of God. Is to be born again. <clears throat> you were born in the Canaanite society. You were born lost. But if you'll get born again, you can get in the godly line of Seth. Now, how, how do you do that? How do you go from being religious to having a relationship? Born again. How do you go from being lost to being saved? Born again. How do you go from being the seed of the devil? Because everybody that was born naturally is born the seed of the devil. How do you go from being born the seed of the devil to the seed of God? Born again. How do you become the no longer the offspring of the devil, but the offspring of God? Born again. How do you go from life, from death to life? Born again. How do you go from darkness to light? Born again. How do you get out from underneath the first Adam and get underneath the last Adam? Born again. How do you, how does your name stay in the last book of life? By regeneration. Born again. Now how do you get born again? Acts 2.38. Repent. First step. Not last step. First step. Repent. That means you say, God, I'm turning my life over to you. You go to a church, go to the front of the church sometime, you say, I'm going to accept the Lord as my personal Savior. And I repent and I make the Lord of my life. I'm saved. No, you're not. All you did was take the first step. Don't you even understand that in birth in the natural, that there's a process of birth? When you're conceived, you're not born. You're begotten by the Word of God. You heard the Word of God. That started the conception process. But there's steps that you take that causes birth. So you hear the Word. That starts the conception process. You get under conviction of your sin. You repent of that sin. That's the first step. But the Lord said, you must be born again of the water and the Spirit. So you took the first step. That's repentance. Then it says, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. That's how you got up. Up from underneath the old Adam into the new Adam. Now, when we get a little bit further in Genesis 5, I'm going to show that to you. Because you took the name of Jesus. Second step. You don't, listen, we don't believe in baptismal regeneration. We don't believe that once you repent and get baptized, you're saved. We believe it takes the Holy Ghost also. So you repent of your sins, baptize in water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, water and spirit. You must be born again of the water and the spirit. 
or you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You're still in the world system. You're still in the kingdom of the world. So there's definite steps that you take to get you out of that system and to get you in the kingdom of God. Anybody tells you all you got to do is accept the Lord's your personal Savior, put you in the kingdom, put you in a new birth experience, they better go to the Word of God. Because all the way back in the book of Genesis, in this fourth chapter, the Bible says Adam knew his wife again. And she bore a son. Say, born again. It's not the first birth that's chosen, Cain. It's the second birth that's chosen, Abel. You're born once, you die twice. You die twice. Come on. Let me say this. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. Say born twice. Die once. I got born physically. Then I got born again spiritually. I'm only going to die one time possibly physically. But I'll never die spiritually. Cain is the first birth, not chosen. Abel's the second birth, chosen. You can follow it all the way through the Word of God. Esau, the first was not chosen. Jacob, the second son, was chosen. God's looking for a born again, new birth people. Not just born once, but born twice. So this Canaanite system, are you seeing what the Bible is trying to show you? Okay, next thing you need to understand is this. The Bible says, and to Seth, verse 26, and to Seth to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos, say Enos. Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. A lot of people interpret that to mean that uh, idolatry, that they started calling idols by the name of the Lord. But I got to thinking about this. It talks about the godly line coming into existence. It talks about Seth being born. Then he gives birth to a son named Enos. And it says, Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Which I believe they started praying to God. And the first step into getting being saved is lifting your voice and invoking the name of God in prayer. You don't pray, you don't talk to God, you can't be saved. So they begin to really pray and seek God during this time. Evil's all around them. But we got a godly line, we got people praying, they're calling on the name of the Lord. Notice in, in verse 1, chapter 5. Now we're in the godly line. Y'all see this? This book of Generations of Adam. Say generations. In the day that God created man in the likeness of God and made him him. Now, hallelujah. We're going to look at this godly line in a moment. We're going to see some comparisons. Beautiful things in the Word of God. But as you follow this ungodly Canaanite system, you're going to see that there's people who's calling on the name of the Lord. They are worshipers of God. There's a last day church that are worshipers of God. They love God. They lift their voice. They talk to God. They praise Him. They worship Him. They're not, listen, they're not like the Canaanites who have a religious substitution. Religious substitution. You'll never see religious substitution running around a church. You'll never see religious substitution jumping up and praising the name of the Lord. You'll never see religious substitution shouting with the voice of triumph. You'll never see that. You'll never see a man or a woman who's got religion praising God out loud. But show me a man and woman who's got the life of God in them. I'll show you a man and a woman that gives God glory. And glory flows out of their mouth. (laughs) 
see, there's a witness. God didn't leave Himself without a witness. He's got people worshiping in the midst of that ungodly stuff. He's got a people in these last days who are worshiping Him in the midst of ungodliness and darkness and sin all around them. Then He's going to raise up a man who's a prophet. Enoch is his name to prophesy to that generation. But that generation won't repent. Are you with me? We'll see that in just a little bit. It's a generation. Genesis 6 1 says that it's multiplying upon the earth. People are multiplying. Population is growing. Another sign of the last days. Population is growing tremendously. Are you with me now? You're going to see in Genesis 6 occultism, spiritism, demonology in Genesis 6. We have that today. We have man glorifying himself, making himself God. All right, let's look at chapter 5, verse 1. This is the godly line. Now, here's the sad part. And I'm going to get to the sad part before I get to the good part. The sad part is that this godly line even gets swallowed up by the ungodly. God prophesied in the last days that a great apostasy would take place. If it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. This godly line of Seth got swallowed up in the world system. Only the people, oh, listen, Noah, his three sons, his wife, and their three wives were saved. All the godly line of Seth got swallowed up in the world. If you're not careful, the spirit of this age will swallow you up. Let's look at chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. Everybody got your Bibles open? Hallelujah. If you don't have your Bibles open, why'd you come? Well, I'm not reading funny book to you. I'm reading the Holy Word of God. You need to have your Bible with you. I can get up here and stand up here and tell you ever, anything. Created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. Say their name Adam. In the day when they were created. So they're both called Adam. You've got Adam and you've got Adam. <laughs> Before the fall it wasn't Adam and Eve. It was Adam and Adam. He called their name Adam. Because they were in one family, the one family of God. And they had one identity. But when sin came into the world, they became separated from God. And they be began to have separate identities. Go to Ephesians. See, all this, God shows us the end from the beginning. Ephesians 3, and this is the book we're studying in, in, on Sunday mornings. Ephesians 3. I hope I'm not boring you tonight. Hallelujah. I'll tell you what let's do. Let's start up there in verse 13 of Ephesians 3. Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Spirit of God, Lord, Spirit, Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God come in human form. Come on, you with me? For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and in earth is named. When did you start getting called by the one name? When you were baptized in water in that name. You show me one place in the Bible that you ever get called by the name of Jesus other than water baptism. 
You take the name of the whole family in heaven and in earth. It's called by that one name. It started out being one name in the beginning. It's going to end up with one name in the end. That's why you got to get baptized in the name of Jesus to get filled with the Holy Ghost. So you get out from underneath that old society and you get underneath the new society. There's a last Adam. His name is Jesus. There's a last Eve, and it's not Mary. The last Eve is the church of the living God. God's good, isn't He? And Adam lived 130 years to beget a son in His own likeness. Say His own likeness. After His image. And called His name Seth. Oh yeah, we're still in the image of God, but it's uh, an image that's marred. So I got a question for you. When do you think that you actually become back in the image of God? Truly in the image of God. Hebrews 1 says that Jesus Christ is the expressed image of God. So the only way that you actually become back in the image of God is when you get the image of God in you. How do you get the image of God in you, Jesus Christ? It's when you get filled with Him. The Holy Ghost is the Spirit of Jesus. Romans 8 talks about the Spirit spirit of Christ dwell in you. So I really get in the image of God when I get filled with the Holy Ghost. See, the new birth. It's all in the new birth. If you're not born again, you haven't even started the walk yet. Oh, you are just religious flesh on your way. The Bible says in verse 3, Now, and Adam lived 130 years, but got a son in his own likeness, had his image, and called his name Seth. Say Seth. Seth. There's Seth. He's the picture of the godly line, and Jesus Christ is going to be born through his line. You notice the Bible tells us, it gives us time frames here now when you get into the godly line. Before, there wasn't any time given. There's no numeration given to the ungodly line. Because God, listen, you know whose history God is concerned with? He's not concerned with the history of the ungodly. He's concerned with the history of the godly. So he says, this is the time frames. In Genesis 4, he doesn't even talk about them dying. But in Genesis 5, he talks about them dying. Because he's concerned. Because that's his people. But he's not too concerned about the ungodly line. Now if they come over and get born again, he's concerned about their history but you really don't have a history without God you're nothing without God I'm nothing without God if you're not tied back to God you're nothing you see these things and it doesn't talk about them building up great big cities it doesn't talk about them hallelujah building being an artificer with brass and metal and things It doesn't talk about them being nomads and being herders and all of that. Come on. Because God says their focus is not this world. Their focus is the Spirit. Man. Say Seth. All right. Verse 5. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. Say 930 years and he died. Seth lived 105 years and begat Enos. See the time, the numerations here? No numerations before. Okay? Are y'all ready? And then it keeps on going. It talks about, verse 7, Seth lived after he begat Enos 807 years, begat sons and daughters. Man, they're living a long time now. And all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. And Enos lived 90 years and begat Canaan. And Enos, say, oh, there's another Enos. Say, Enos. Enos. Lived after he begat Canaan 815 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enos were 905 years and he died. And Canaan lived 70 years and begat Mahalil. Say, Mahalil. God, you you can't pray through. Maybe you can... (laughs) And Canaan lived after he begat... Mahalil, 840 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Canaan were 910 years and he died. 
And Mahalalel lived 65 years and begat Jared. And Mahalalel lived after he begat Jared 830 years and begat sons and daughters. And the days of Mahalalel were 895 years and he died. And Jared lived 162 years and he begat Enoch. Say Enoch. <laughs> well, I think we'll just stop right there. Because every one of these names... Just like we went through the book of Joshua. And we put one name with another name with another name with another name. And every name lined up together is giving you a story in the Bible. I showed you that principle in Joshua. Now let me show it to you in the book of Genesis. Seth means a substitute. He means appointed or a substitute. Let me just back up to Adam because Enoch is the seventh from Adam. So let's go back to Adam. Adam is a picture of the natural man. His name means red and earthly. Next, next one we have, all right, Cain's dead, uh, Cain's rejected, Abel's dead, Seth takes his place, the third, you with me? Adam, the natural man, then Seth, the substitute, Jesus Christ came into this world because we were natural and we needed a Savior, He came to be our substitute. And then Seth had Enos, right? Enos, you know what Enos means? It means dying. So the natural man needed a substitute, so the substitute came and he died, Enos, for you. And then the next name means redemption. When he died for you, he redeemed you. That's Canaan. Are you with me? And then Maha, Maha'alil, Maha'alil means the splendor of God. So not only was our substitute, not only did He die for us, not only did He redeem us, but He rose from the dead by the splendor of God and the power of God. And then we keep on reading down here, Maha, Maha'alil lived after He begot Jared. Jared, say Jared. Oh, Jared means poured out. What happened on the day of Pentecost? The Holy Ghost was poured out. And we're living in the days right now of Jared. The Holy Ghost was poured out. But we go on to the next one, and that's Enoch. And Enoch there means instruction. So I'm living in a time right now where I'm getting instructed. I'm getting ready. I'm getting prepared in the Spirit for the literal reign of Jesus Christ. I think I'll just go on and follow through this. i got to go back to Enoch and preach this Enoch to you. But notice this. that Bible 21 says that after the seventh, then we have the eighth. This is Methuselah. Say Methuselah. And Methuselah means this. When he dies, it shall come. What's going to come? The flood's going to come. It's a type of the tribulation period. But what happened to Enoch before the flood came? He was translated or raptured out. So before the tribulation comes on this world, God's going to take the church. He's going to translate us out of this world. And then Methuselah is going to come when he, listen, when he dies, it shall come. That's the tribulation period. See, God's given you 7,000 years of history right here. He showed us the end from the beginning. And if that wasn't enough, the next name is Lamech. We got another Lamech here. But this is a godly Lamech. You know what that means? His name means king and conqueror. So when he comes back after the tribulation period, he's coming back as king of kings and lord of lords. And when he comes back, he's going to set up the kingdom age. And what is the predominant characteristic of the kingdom age? Rest. So Lamech gave birth to a man by the name of Noah, whose name means rest. So 7,000 years of history is laid out right here in this chapter through the godly line of sin. We had a natural man. We had a substitute. We had a man who died, who brought redemption. And then he rose from the dead. And then he poured out his spirit. Then he gave us instruction. Then the tribulation period is going to come. But not till that one that's instructed is caught out. And then after that, 
Then you got him coming back as king of kings, the Lord of lords in Lamech. And then you got him setting up the kingdom age in Noah. That's the rest of God. And by the way, this is the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Hey! Aleph was the first chapter. Bait was the second chapter. Third chapter was Gimel. Fourth chapter was Talit the door. Fifth chapter is the hay. This one right here. And that, this, that means the breath of God. It means the Spirit of God. Woo. And when was the Holy Ghost poured out? At the beginning of the fifth day of man's history. In the fifth thousandth year of his, in the fifth millennium, the Holy Ghost was poured out. The fifth day, the fifth letter means the breath, the hay of God. But it also means the shout. And a man was full of the Spirit. He worked with God. And then God said, come up hither. God took him out by His Spirit. It's all laid out in the Word of God. He gave us the end from the beginning. No wonder He says, as in the days of Noah, so shall all so be the coming. Also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. The sad part is this godly line gets swallowed up with them. So you better be on guard because we haven't arrived yet. We haven't been taken out yet. We got to walk with God. We got to be instructed. We got to be preached to. You'll never be saved if you don't have somebody preaching to you. But I'm going to tell you, God has not left this world without a witness. He's got some worshipers. He's got some people that are witnesses. He's got some people that have truth that are going to preach to this world. Then He's going to take us out. And the tribulation period is going to start. You see this? Right there. That's the rapture. This is the beginning of the tribulation period right there. Glory to God. See, I want to be an Enoch in these last days. I don't want to be a Kenite. Because remember, Enoch is the seventh from Adam. He's the picture of the height. Of godliness. Lamech in the Canaanite system is a picture of the height of ungodliness. Celebrating murder. But Enoch is celebrating life. Woo! I'm feeling good all over. Hallelujah. Now don't sit there and say, boy, this is complicated. This is simple. This is simple. Let's look at Enoch. Because he's a picture of where we are right now. Jared is the sixth Holy Ghost dispensation. But remember, there's evil all around. And there's sin all around. But the seventh Enoch is a picture of instruction. People hearing the Word of God. Learning of God. Serving God. Living for God. Faithful to God. Holy, holy people. So let's see, let's talk about Enoch. Y'all want to? And then, then I'll let y'all go home. Notice what it says. And Enoch lived 16, five years and begat Methuselah. Now somehow he got a revelation. I know where the revelation came. It came from God. Because he couldn't have named his son Methuselah if he didn't have a revelation from God. Because the name Methuselah again, what does it mean? When he dies, it shall come. Oh, so he lived 65 years and he has a son calls him Methuselah and every time he walks over into the crib oh hallelujah I'm going to have some fun now every time he walks over and looks in the crib at little Methuselah he says when he dies it's going to come and he didn't know when Methuselah was going to die one year went by and he said, Methuselah, you're still here, but I know when you die, it's going to come. Two years went by, he still hasn't died yet. 500 years. <laughs> well, by then, Enoch's already gone, but Methuselah's still living. So the grace of God, listen, he lived to be 969 years old. He lived longer than any man has ever lived. That shows you the long suffering and the patience of God to try to reach a lost world. 
He didn't die the first year, the second year, the third year. Oh, hallelujah. A hundred years go by. Enoch says you're not dead yet, so judgment isn't going to come yet. But I want to show you something. 65 years, Enoch evidently did not walk with God. But when he had that son, something changed. Because the Bible says 65, the Bible, let me read it to you. Enoch lived 65 years and begot who? Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah. Not before. He didn't even know God. But oh, somehow God gave him a revelation that his offspring was going to be a sign to the world that the judgment would come when he dies. And when he got that revelation from God, I'm talking to some of you who don't have a revelation of what I'm talking about. But when you get this revelation, I don't care how old you are right now. If you get this revelation that I'm preaching to you now, you can begin to walk with God. It was after he begot Methuselah, that sign of his generation, that he walked with God. And he walked with God for 300 more years. Something happened to him. But let's find out a little bit about this man. Jude verse 14. Let's turn there quickly. Find out a little bit about this man, Enoch. The seventh from Adam. Jude verse 14. Remember this is the door into the book of Revelation. Hallelujah. I wish we could hear this. (laughs) And Enoch also what? The seventh from Adam. What? The seventh from Adam. He's not only a picture of the rapture of the church. I proved that already to you. But he's a picture of the seventh day. What's going to happen to those who live through the kingdom age? They live through the seventh. What's going to happen to them? They live. They live for a whole thousand years and don't even die. They got to be translated. You know what's going to happen to them? After that thousand year kingdom age, they're going to be translated and planted in the heavens. How long are they going to live on the earth? Probably about 365 years. 365 days, 365 years, the time of probation. And it said, you walk with me, you fulfill the time of probation. Come up here. I'm going to plant you in the heavens. He's a picture of kingdom age saints that live for a thousand years, but got to be planted in the heavens. Oh, I wish I had time. Remember Jesus, the Bible said that he set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem. It also tells you in the Gospel of Luke that when he would have been received up, he set his face to Jerusalem. You know what he's telling you right there? Is that Jesus Christ lived so perfectly in the will of God that he could have been caught up just like Enoch and never gone to the cross. But when he started getting transfigured before them, he started taking on a glorified manifestation. He said, no, I've got to go and die for them on the cross. And so when he would have been received up, He set his face steadfastly towards Jerusalem to die for you. But he could have been received up because he fulfilled his time of probation. So you want that? Go look for the transfiguration. It'll tell you, all right? I believe it's Luke 9. So in the kingdom age, people are going to be walking with God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What are you going to do with him? going to leave him on the earth? No. They're going to be caught up. They're going to fulfill the time of probation. He's going to plant him in the heavens. I wish I had time to show you the prophets and show you how they're planted in the heavens. God's an awesome God. Give him a hand clap. Oh, hallelujah. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these things, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. He was a prophet all the way in the beginning of time. He was telling people, Jesus is going to come back. And he's going to come back with ten thousands of his saints. He's not going to come back by himself. I'm coming back with him. Come on, man. He's walking around in that generation, the days of Noah, and he's saying, hey, you better get ready because Jesus is coming. And Jesus hadn't even come yet the first time. 
But he looked all the way. Here, oh, shit. He, he looked with one neck and pick a prophecy. He, come on. He looked all the way to the end. He saw the coming of the Lord. He, And he hadn't even come yet the first time. And he's already talking about the second coming. Because listen to me, his works were finished from the foundation of the world. In eternity, it was just as good as God. He even got a revelation. He saw in the eternal dimension. And he said, I see the Lord coming. And there's some people right now in this church and other places that have not lost that message. A lot of people are preaching there's not going to be a rapture. That the church is going to go through the tribulation period. But there's still somebody sounding the alarm and telling people everywhere that Jesus is coming. But they still wouldn't repent. They were stubborn. They were hard hearted. They were full of pride. Worshippers around them and prophets around them, but they still refuse to get right with God. But we're not going to give up. We're going to keep walking with the Lord. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. See what else the Lord has to say about Enoch. Because he's a type of you. Let's look at uh, verse 5. Say by faith. Not by how you feel. You go by feelings. One day you feel like you're all right. The next day you feel backslid. You better not go by your feelings. You got to walk by faith. You got to trust God. You got to serve Him. Come on, you got to walk with Him. Because when you know He's coming back, that means, hey, you know what? He could come back today. So I better be walking with Him today. By faith, Enoch was translated. See, he had a revelation. The Lord was coming. But not just coming in the last days, but coming for him. See, I got a revelation. He's coming for me. And I'm not just talking about his second coming in the rapture. I'm talking about he's coming to me right now by the Holy Ghost. He's always coming. He's always moving. I think you're getting the picture here. Hallelujah. Remember Genesis 1, it talks about and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep. God is a moving God. Revelation 22 says, Behold, He, what? He's coming. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Genesis, He's moving. Revelation, He's coming. And in between, Bible says, as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. What that means is this, God's a moving God. And you better be moving in the moving God. Because if you're not moving with a spirit, you're going to get a Laodicea spirit. You're going to get lukewarm and carnal and fleshly. And you're not going to move in the Holy Ghost. You're going to be lukewarm. So between the moving and the coming of God, you better be led. By faith, Enoch was translated. That old word translated there, you know what that means? He's taken over to the other side. He was in the dimension of the present in the world, the earthly, in the physical. And all of a sudden, God said, come up. You know what he did? God just carried him across the chasm. He carried him from the physical into the eternal bodily. Physically. See, that's what I'm looking for. I'm listening for his voice every day. By faith. And I'm not about to get lukewarm and carnal and sit on my laurels. Sit on my leaves. Become at ease in Zion and become carnal. If he's coming, I'm going to be moving. Man, hallelujah. 
he, hey, if he could walk with God for 300 years in the midst of this evil that he was surrounded by, you and I can live for God. Listen, if he don't come in my lifetime, I'll die at probably around 100 or 150 or 200. <laughs> y'all don't kill me first. No, I'm joking. I uh, know y'all are great. Hallelujah. Okay, what did it say? By faith, Enoch was translated. Why was he translated? Let's say he was not found. He was translated, they couldn't find the guy. Mom and dad went and looked for him and said, Hey, Enoch, knocked on the door of Enoch's house. Enoch's nowhere. Where's Enoch? Don't know. Went to his boss on his job and said, Hey, where's Enoch? Don't know. We've been looking for him all day. He didn't show up to work this morning. He was not what? He was not found. He was not here anymore. Why? Because God took him. And I want to tell you something tonight. If you're not born again of the water of the Spirit, and your children just happen to disappear and God takes them, you go looking for them, you're not going to find them. They were not. Because God took them. I try just about everything I can to get my family saved. And I say, I tell you what, we're all going to be gone someday. Don't you want to go with us? Don't you don't want to go with your grandkids? We're going to disappear from this place. Look, look. He, the Bible said he wasn't found. They looked for him. I hope they don't find you. But I want to let you in on something right now. If you feel like you're ready for that event, you probably are. But if you don't feel like you're ready, you're probably not. So you better just get your mind made up. Because it says by faith he was translated. If you don't have faith in that event, you're going to be left standing here when it happens. He was not found. Why? Because God had translated him. Why did he do that? For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. You know why he got taken out? Because he pleased God. That means he lived holy in the midst of a sinful society. And this, I'm sure the society is putting pressure on Enoch. Come on. Come on. Go dance with it, Enoch. See, I always, I'm just now, I, I, I say always, I'm just now starting to wonder what ever happened to Miss Enoch. <laughs> about that my friend it doesn't say that Enoch's wife and his children went Methuselah was left behind we know he outlived Enoch was his wife also left behind I want to tell you something you better live for God even when your wife doesn't hallelujah you better make up your mind you're going to live holy Your family, your whole family probably won't live for God. We pray they do, but they probably won't. Main thing is, are you? Let's go back to Genesis, okay? I mean, God showed us the end from the beginning. Hallelujah. He walked with Him for 300 years. Y'all tired? No? 
Notice 22, and Enoch walked with God after begat Methuselah 300 years, begat sons and daughters. Sons, plural, and daughters, plural. He was the only one that went, according to the Bible. And I'm getting pretty hot. Can somebody turn that thing on the air conditioner? No, just turn the heat off, please. I tell you what, man, you are the coldest people I have been around in my life. Every time I come in here, that thing's sitting over on a 75 or 80. Man, you put that thing on 60, 65, it'll be nice and just right. You might even make the rapture. Mm. Y'all doing all right out there? Y'all nice and warm? I'll see how y'all do it. Notice the Bible said, And Enoch walked with God after he begat through the 300 years. He begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. So that means he walked with God 365. He didn't. Did that make sense? He walked with God for 300 years, but for 65 years he didn't. Which lets me know you got a chance. At some point in your life you get a revelation of what I'm preaching. You can get saved and you can start walking with God. Mm. The Spirit of God will draw you and give you revelation. The Bible says, And Enoch walked with God, and he was, now again, here we go, and he was not, for God took him. First person to get raptured out of the world. Just carried him over on the other side. It's going to be so nice when the Lord comes back. One day we're here. And the next were not. And everybody's going to be running. If, if you're gone, they're going to be running around looking for you. And somewhere along the line, it's going to dawn on them. Hey! You know what? Not only is he gone, but she's gone. And you know what? They had something in common. They were baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost and they live holy. <laughs> of course, you know how the world's going to try to explain that away, don't you? Aliens came and got these people. They're resisting growth, you know. Another thing, the world's getting so big, you know, they just came and got us out of here. Are you here? <sighs> and Enoch walked with God. He was not for God. Took him, verse 25. But those lived 180 years and seven and begat Lamech. Say Lamech. Conquering king. Powerful king. Do you see that the society of the godly in Enoch prevailed over the ungodly of the Canaanites? The faith of Abel prevailed over the false religious system. Well, that didn't do nothing for you, so. Notice this. And Methuselah lived after he begat Lamech 780 and two years and begat sons and daughters in the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. Ooh, that means the flood section to come. But I'm telling you what is so sad to me is this godly line gets swallowed up in the ungodly. And only one full family makes it out. You better listen to what God is saying. This world is after you. The devil is after you. He wants to pull you away. He wants you to get carnal and not spiritual. He wants you to walk by the flesh and not by faith. See, some people preach unconditional eternal security, which means once saved, always saved. I believe in the security of God, but the Bible says that you must keep yourself in the love of God. No man can pluck them out of his hands, the Bible says. And they use that to preach unconditional eternal security, once saved, always saved. Well, you might not be able to pull me out of his hands and the devil can't pull me out of his hands, but I can pull myself out of his hands. 
You don't believe me? The prodigal son was disinherited. He was a son, but he was disinherited. He was born to the father, but he was disinherited. And the father said he was dead, but now he's alive when he came back. Which means you leave God, you're going to be disinherited and you'll be dead. But if you make yourself back to God, then you'll be seen as alive. Now notice, and I'm going to close. I'm almost through. Y'all can almost endure this, can't you? And Lamech lived 182 years and get a son. Hallelujah. Ooh, he's got a testimony too. He's going to wait for peace to come. He's going to wait for the rest to come. Typically in Noah. Here he is. There's Noah. There's my son. We're going to call him Noah. We're going to call him rest. We're going to call him peace. And even though that son was born and they lifted him up and said he's the peace and rest of God, the world still refused to repent. They worshiped, but the world refused to repent. They prophesied, but the world refused to repent. They had a sign in Noah. Lamech believed in the promise and the rest. They refused to repent. And Lamech lived after he begat Noah 595 years, begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Lamech were 770 and 7, 777. And he's the one who gave birth to the son of rest. And the number 7 is the rest of God. Dispensationally, it, come on, are you with me? In case you don't realize it, we're now 6,001. Which means we have just begun the 7th millennium. And he was 777 years old, the number of the rest of God. You better wake up. God's fixing to take us into the kingdom age. But remember before that, there's the tribulation and there's the translation of the saints. That's the Enoch people. Methuselah. Then, then listen. Then Lamech, he's going to come back as king of kings and lord of lords. He's going to set up that kingdom age, which is a thousand years upon this earth. That's the Noah generation. That's the rest generation. So we have moved into it literally in time. But I was already there spiritually in the Holy Ghost. Because when you got the Holy Ghost, you got the rest of God. This is the rest wherein He will cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, the Bible says. And that's the Holy Ghost. It's all laid out for us, church. And I'm not a date setter, and I don't believe in setting dates, but I believe the Bible does. I don't set dates, but the Bible does. I'm going to tell you again, I don't set dates, but the Bible does. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, say Shem. Ooh, that mighty warrior of righteousness who stood against the bell false religious system of his day. We need some people that's got some fire and zeal about them, man. And then there's old Ham, which means the darkened one. He was spiritually dark. We're going to have fun. I'm telling you, we're going to have. And then we got <coughs> Japheth. Say Japheth. That's where I came from. I'm a descendant of Japheth. And in chapter 6, we'll look at the, the chapter before the flood. And we're going to see the ungodly seed. And we're going to see why God sent the flood. And we're going to go to a New Testament book. And it tells you all about the chapter 6. And we're going to talk about the sons of God coming together with the daughters of men. And we're going to explain to you what that is. And it's taken me about 20 years to finally believe what I'm going to tell you next week. Okay? Let's stand in prayer. <laughs>
Father, I love you. I love you, Lord, tonight. I praise you tonight. <laughs> you're good. You're awesome. You're great. You're worthy to be praised. You're worthy to be glorified. You're worthy to be praised and worshipped and adored and lifted up. I thank God. I thank you, Lord, for godly people. People who want to live holy. People who just love your word and love the truth. Hallelujah. People that came out on a very cold night. But they're just so hungry for this word, oh God. Hallelujah. Bless their desire, God. Bless their commitment, Lord. Oh, glory. Glory. Use us in these last days, Father, to be a sign and a witness to this generation, to the power and the goodness of Jesus Christ. Let's give the Lord a good hand clap. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 <clears throat> praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. How many of you ladies are going to live holy? Hey, don't worry about the canines. Tell them, look at them, tell them, you need what I got. Say, it's a privilege to live like I live. They ask you, what are you? I tell them, I'm a holy roller. Hallelujah. I'm a holy roller. I'm a tongue-talking, Jesus' name, one God, Holy Ghost field, holy roller. <laughs> in the old days, old days of Pentecost, People in the world, they go up to those crazy Pentecostal people, you know, they have their meetings. They'd go look inside the windows. They could see through the windows. It's through the door. And you know what they said about those crazy Pentecostal people? They see them rolling around on the floor. Hallelujah. They see them speaking in tongues. They said somebody put some kind of magic dust on them. <laughs> It's not magic dust, man. It's the Holy Ghost of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. We, we have it easy these days. In those days, man, they egg their houses and spit on them. Come on. <laughs> I thank God for this heritage. I thank God for this truth. Praise God. Amen. Well, God bless y'all. Y'all have a wonderful evening. And maybe the Lord could come tonight. And I, I pray that I'm ready. And if I'm not, I told you before, just get your rope and throw it down there. And I'll reach up there and grab it. And you pull me up with you, all right? You're not leaving without me. <laughs> Because every time I lay my head on that bed, I lift my eyes to glory. And I say, God, this can be the night. Let me be found worthy to stand in your presence.